good afternoon and welcome to the Friday Transportation Seminar today. And I'm Robert Bertini and uh, along with Jennifer Dill and John Cleavy and Chris Monsier, we organized this seminar series. And we've all, we're, uh, and Miguel Filiazzi now. So uh, we're coming up on our 200th seminar um, near the end of uh, next term. So we've been doing this for a while. And today we're very pleased to have Kostas Antoniou from the National Technical University of Athens in Greece speaking about online calibration for dynamic traffic assignment. So I'll turn it over to you and make sure you turn Thank on. Thank you. Yeah, I, I just did. Thanks. So as Professor Bertini said, my name is Constantino Santaniu Costas. Um, I'll give you just a very quick background on me so that uh, we have an idea, you have an idea. And uh, then before proceeding on the core of my presentation, I thought uh, that it might be useful to go very quickly on what DTA is uh, before going into the more uh, elaborate stuff, uh, online calibration of such a model. And uh, the plan is to try to stay within 45 minutes so that this will allow us then to have a Q&A with m perhaps me answering things that are more of an interest to you. And I guess during the presentation, if you need to ask me something, uh, if you want me to slow down, speed up, please do. So my, uh, I'm a civil engineer, transportation engineer by training from, with a diploma from the, master, from the National Technical University of Athens. Then I have a master's and PhD uh, in transportation from MIT. Uh, for the past three years, I'm back in Greece, and I'm currently the director of a, the Athens branch of a Greek consulting company called Tredit, and doing a postdoc at MIT of, uh, remotely and uh, working in some research, uh, research projects at uh, NTUA. Um, what I'm going to do, I'm going to switch now to to the general DTA staff. And I'm going to use uh, Dynamit as an example. This is one of the two pro uh, models that were developed in parallel f from a Federal Highway Administration uh, grant. Uh, it was Dynamit developed at MIT and Dynasmart at uh, the University of Texas at Austin. Um, uh, these were funded as competing in a good sense projects to investigate the feasibility and now they're both uh, uh, complete and evaluated under further evaluation and so on. So what, uh, and I'm going to use Dynamit as an example, but this should cover uh, DTA in general, dynamic traffic assignment in general. Uh, so Dynamit is a simulation based system uh, it's intended to be real time. Now the components that uh, are in, in Dynamite and DTA models make it very easy to also use it for as a new model for planning studies. So there are also planning counterparts to these models. But as this, the idea was to use it online and real time. This is what we're I'm using as a as a the basis here. And these systems are uh, intended to predict traffic conditions. Short-term traffic conditions, maybe one hour uh, is a reasonable horizon, and to provide travel information to the drivers. This is an idea of what the graphical user interface uh, looks like in a network in Irvine, California. The reason why I'm uh, showing this here early on is that uh, to give you also an idea of the level of detail of such models, these are so-called mesoscopic simulators. So they are more detailed than macroscopic models, but less detailed than microscopic. So we don't model the, beha the driving behavior of each vehicle, how they change lane, how they, the car following models, and so on, that microscopic traffic simulators do. But on the other hand, we do track the trajectory of each individual vehicle using, for example, a speed density relationship for, for the moving part of the segments but then track its individual vehicle. We don't come up with just an aggregate measure in the same way or that the macroscopic models uh, use. And then again, in the queuing section of the segment, when we reach, for example, an intersection, there might be a traffic signal and vehicles queue there. We uh, go a little bit deeper into detail. We look at, each indi at individual lanes and queuing patterns. And uh, to give a motivation of one reason why we do that is, for example, if you want to, if the right lane or the left turn lane is blocked, we want to separate it from the other lanes, the ones moving ahead perhaps uh, without an obstruction. So we want to be able to model that. 
On the demand side, where there is, there's also some very detailed modeling, there are microscopic behavioral discrete choice uh, analysis models of uh, the driving behavior in response to, uh, to traffic information, and we model uh, route choice, mode choice, departure time choice, and even canceling trip. Uh, and because transit is not explicitly modeled, uh, this is perhaps uh, a way to model transit. So if people cancel uh, their trip, we could assume that they're moving into, into public transit. Uh, and these microscopic models are coupled with uh, macroscopic uh, travel demand tra forecasting models like uh, for the OD estimation, for this is how the prediction is done, the uh, short-term prediction uh, using Kalman filter-based uh, models. I guess I actually talked that while we're looking at the picture before. Um, when we're talking about real time, we mean that data is coming, is being collected and fed into uh, Dynamit, into the, the DTA model. This has actually been done in an application in Los Angeles, uh, TMC in downtown Los Angeles, where uh, the system was oper is operational, it's collecting the data, it's making short term predictions. Um, and there are other applications that are moving towards that goal of becoming uh, operational, like one in New York uh, State in Lower Westchester County, where the idea is to use it for the development of, uh, of uh, a development evaluation of diversion strategies for incidents. Um, obviously, when we're talking about real time, it means that we need to be really fast, and that's why we are not using a microscopic traffic simulator, for example, to do it, which would give us a, giver, a bigger accuracy. The point is that we uh, first of all, we cannot make it uh, real time, but even if in five or ten years using faster computers we could, uh, one could argue that it's not really necessary uh, because in any case you are doing predictions and you don't need the 1% accuracy. Uh, in the past, uh, when computers were much slower, this was uh, implemented as a distributed model, but then we saw that the overhead of moving things around, information and around and so on, and the complication was not really worth it. So currently we are using a monolithic approach and moving into the future, which is uh, parallelizing it. And there are many challenges, those that are involved in modeling uh, un understand the difficulties. It's not as simple as breaking down the network because then you have a lot of bookkeeping to do during boundary c conditions. And even worse, you lose some of the, of the um, intelligence of the system when it's, uh, for example, handling traffic in a path-based approach. So you start from your origin to your destination, and then you have to break this path into smaller uh, sub-networks. This becomes very problematic, especially when you want to divert traffic. And then the, the system that is managing one subnetwork doesn't know what the conditions are in the other subnetwork, so it doesn't know how to reroute them. Uh, just an idea of what uh, we are doing in terms of the rolling horizon. So suppose we get data from, quarter to, from 7.30 to quarter to 8. We do a traffic estimation. What this could be is maybe 50 or 100 sensors, uh, data from 50 or 100 sensors. Our goal is to first get an estimate of the state in the entire network from these few point measurements. And then once we have this, we make a prediction into the future. And uh, we disseminate this information through variable message science, for example. Um, we'll probably talk about the issues uh, later. Yes. Um, the big issue with traffic information, providing traffic information, is what we see. We try to visualize a little bit here in contrast with weather conditions. I mean, if we listen to the radio that it's going to rain or that it's going to be sunny, it doesn't matter. It's not going to change the weather. It's still going to be like that. It could help us our planning in response to the weather. But whatever we do, even if we do get an umbrella or if we don't, the weather will stay the same, assuming the prediction is correct, which is another story. Now, with traffic, suppose we have this situation. So, suppose we have congestion in one uh, road, and then we know that there's an alternative route that is uh, uncongested. If we give the, the correct information, then we could move hopefully closer to, to, this, to a balanced use of the residual capacity of the traffic. Of course, there's a danger that we could cause overreaction and everybody will shift to the uncongested route. So if we say in the variable message signs and in the radio, oh, you know, route B is congested, there is an incident, everybody step away from that, 
then we could have the opposite situation. So this is not very simple. It's, an, it's a complicated problem. And it's one that uh, this system is trying to model by doing many iterations and many loops between the demand and the supply. So at every time, it's trying to evaluate the impact of the information that has been provided to the travelers. So it's it wants to assess the, the impact of the information that is being traveled to the traffic conditions. And this has to be consistent. So we want the drivers, when they react to the information that we're going to provide to them and drive to their destination, to experience the traffic conditions that they have been warned about. Uh, OK, I think now we're going to move back. to the core of the presentation. So essentially, what I'm going to do is, since I've motivated and discussed a little bit about the DTA framework, uh, say, uh, motivate the need for online calibration of that uh, framework or for other similar systems, present the formulation and the solution approaches, and then uh, a case study. And in the end, if we have time, and uh, if it uh, in order to simulate perhaps some other discussion, I'm going to very quickly outline some ongoing research following up from this uh, work. Uh, I'm going to try to keep the formulation not very um, mathematics heavy, more light, but obviously if somebody's interested afterwards or even here, if everybody's interested, we can go over that. So the, just uh, I'm going to show uh, the framework for the dynamic traffic assignment uh, uh, concept. Essentially, we have we get data from various sources like surveillance surveillance information, which can be from sensors or from probe vehicles or from automated vehicle identification data, all sorts of information and some uh, the network representation obviously and some historical data. For example, OD patterns in the in the network from a travel survey or from a planning level model that we might have and some a priori parameter values. Now, what are these a priori parameter values? Perhaps the output of, a, of an offline calibration, what we usually call calibration. Now I have to call offline calibration to differentiate it with what I'm doing. So these parameters, let's say there's a root choice model. And we get a parameter for the travel time, which is, say, minus 0.6, whatever this might mean with the units and so on. All of uh, the, 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 everything in our model and in reality is uh, stochastic. So presumably all these parameters are random variables. So what we are getting there is hopefully the mean of these random variables. And we're using it irrespective of the quote-unquote true traffic uh, conditions. The, the idea here is that we can use this global optimum, if you will, value, and then steer it a little bit towards the right, va the right uh, value. Maybe it's a little bit lower today because it's uh, sunny, or maybe it's a little bit higher because it's snowing, and so on, or because it's a holiday, or uh, for some reason there is a fair and a lot of people are going to the downtown, and so on. And we want this, obviously, to be data-driven. Now. Um, once we have all this data and we feed, we feed this data into the state estimation phase where the, the demand and the supply simulation are looping to get a state estimate for the, of the traffic conditions for the entire network. And once this has been established, which means that there is a convergence between the, the output of the demand simulator and the supply simulator, we can move into the prediction phase and we make predictions for an hour, we generate information, and uh, we stop when this information that we predict in an hour through the demand simulator is what the supply simulator says that our travelers would experience. And this is consistency. We call this consistency to uh, differentiate it from the convergence in the state estimation phase. And this information, predictive information, is then uh, disseminated to the travelers, for example, through VMS, variable message signs, or maybe in vehicle units or radio reports. And uh, it affects the network performance, how drivers uh, behave, which we can uh, capture again through the surveillance information, through the new counts. There are many models uh, in this uh, 
in the in this uh, main parameters in the models and components of a DTA model. I don't think there is any reason to go in detail into that. Uh, obviously, this problem is not uh, new. It has been thought before, and uh, in uh, in DTA models in particular, we can say that. Some of the parameters were already calibrated online, like for, the exa for example, the OD flow estimates in, uh, in, the, in this case, in the case of, uh, of Dynamit. So the concept here is that we want to, to do everything, to estimate online, dynamically, and jointly all the parameters in the model. Um, and the, the way that we would like to do it is not in a very uh, uh, system-specific way, but in a general way that can be applied to other models, either in the field and perhaps even outside. And the uh, solution approaches and the references that we have relied on are not strictly from our discipline, are uh, also from other areas. Um, and it shouldn't also depend which parameters we are calibrating or, or which data is available because uh, we don't want it to be restricted to the state of the art today and then 10 years later some new kind of data comes and uh, we cannot use it. And of course we can say that now that uh, we know that the approach handles it okay, before. Uh, the last part that is very important is that this has to be computationally feasible. And this is an online system, real-time system. It means that uh, if we, we, get, uh, we want to make a prediction for half an hour or for an hour, our prediction intervals are 15 minutes. Uh, if we cannot do all that in seven minutes, then it's not relevant anymore. Because by the time we get our predictions, the drivers you know, for an hour, then the drivers don't need it anymore because they have reached their destination. Um, I don't know how many people are uh, familiar here with the state space uh, model, but this is a fairly standard way to model dynamic uh, uh, situations. And uh, the main elements are a state vector, which essentially is a vector with the variables that we want to, to estimate. Um, measurement equations that map this, uh, this vector of uh, parameters to the available measurements that we have. Um, and we'll see some examples later. And transition equations that capture the evolution of this state from over time, from interval to interval. Another idea that we're using uh, and uh, may or na may not be very important uh, now in this context is the idea of deviations. There are several reasons uh, uh, that why this is important. Some are uh, purely numerical, statistical, uh, computational and others are really uh, from an interpretational and a physical point of view. So because all traffic flow, most traffic flow uh, measures are not, uh, the, the, the solution approaches that we're using for the state space model assume normality. And uh, because all the flows, capacities, uh, densities, and so on are positive, so obviously normality there uh, is not always something that is very widely accepted. So the idea of deviation says that instead of working with the actual figures, we subtract some historical value from them and work with the deviations. So presumably, if this devia already this starts to seem uh, to, to, to look a little bit more more normal. And uh, if these values are really uh, representative, the historical, then really we can uh, feel a lot more comfortable with uh, talking about normality. Um, in this context, uh, quickly, just to give an idea of what it means, that uh, the number of parameters, and uh, I think really the point here is to get an idea of the magnitude of the problem, is that uh, the state vector comprises the OD flows, and for a realistic application, this can be between 500 and several thousand OD flows per interval. And uh, model parameters su su on the supply side, such as the segment capacities, so for each segment, one capacity. One could group these together, but then uh, the problem is that if there is an incident in one segment and we want to sense it, this will affect the capacities in, in the entire segment. 
So we try to avoid this, but obviously if the network has 2,000 links, we're talking about segments, we're talking about 2,000 parameters there. Speed density relationship parameters, again, to the limit one could uh, estimate one speed density relationship for each segment, but this is impractical for various reasons involving uh, the data requirements. Uh, so usually here it's a little bit more practical to group them together into a handful of categories of segments with uh, similar uh, traffic dynamics. And for each of these groups there is a small a handful of uh, number of parameters. And for the root choice model parameters are, are also uh, very few. So first we are going to look at the measurement equations and uh, then the transition equations. The measurement equations, there are two types. There are direct measurement equations and indirect measurement equations. What I talked a little bit about before is the indirect measurement equations. The direct measurement equations link our, uh, the estimates that we want to have of each parameter to, the, to some prior information that we have. Now, in other setups, like for example the OD estimation problem, these values are very important because the problem would be underdetermined otherwise. So we would have fewer measurements than unknowns, so we couldn't solve it. Here, it's a little bit stronger, the reason that we need them. The reason that we need them is that we assume that we have good estimates of these parameters from the offline calibration. And all we want to do is do a local optimization step. So we are not solving over the entire response surface, we're just where we want to go away from local optima and so on. We assume that we are close, we are, we are uh, close to the optimum, and we just want to move a little bit to reach it because of the specific uh, conditions that are prevailing right now. So this is fairly simple. As you see at the top, uh, we just, it's uh, very simple. We, we assume an equation of an identity of the value to be estimated from its a priori value with some random error at the end. And in the bottom it's the deviations thing that I mentioned before where we just subtra subtract from, uh, from, these, from both values the same uh, historical value and this is mostly, uh, this serves the various purposes that, we, that uh, I outlined before. Now this is perhaps the most important equation and it's the indirect measurement equation which matches the estimate of the parameter of the state vector to our measurements. Now, the measurements can be speeds, densities, flows, occupancies from the sensors. They could be um, counts from the toll plazas, and maybe if our simulator handles that also by, by vehicle type. They can be travel times from, uh, from probe vehicles, and all sorts of information that we might have. Even uh, also uh, indirect measurements of uh, OD flows. If we have a system that is very dense in terms of transponders, uh, automated vehicle identification system, then perhaps we could have, um, and we have these sensors close to the origins, then we could have some measurement of some OD flows. So we can put everything there in terms of measurements and on the left hand side. And on the right hand side, essentially, what we put is the output of the model when we have fed it with the value of the state vector that we are estimating. And if we can, uh, we assume here that any sort of measurement in the real world, we can also simulate as output from our simulator. And that's what give us, gives us a, a very big degree of flexibility. We, we are not dealing with an analytical uh, model here. We are not, ex an ex uh, we are not excluding one. It could be an analytical, but we are abstracting it a little bit more. Also, be, be, this is important for us because our system is simulation based. And anything output that we want to get, we just get it from the model. That's very easy. Okay. Uh, and then we match these two. So we essentially the idea is that to, in a very simple way, we want to change the values of the parameters that we want to calibrate, the state vector so that the output matches the one that we have observed in the network. And in the middle you see also again how we can uh, uh, make the 
getting deviations formed by subtracting the, uh, some measurements, some historical value of these measurements. Uh, the transition equation is simpler. Uh, we get just an, the evolution of, uh, of the state vector. Uh, this, is a, this essentially allows us to make a prediction, a short-term prediction, which we'll be later correcting using the data. We'll come that to the, to the computational part, to the solution approaches. And this is a simple to regressive process. One could make it fancier by using a general form, but it doesn't really uh, make any sense here. Uh, this is just the model. I don't think we need to uh, spend a lot of time there. Now, uh, let's look at the, linear, uh, the solution approaches. I don't know how many people are familiar with uh, the linear Kalman filter. Uh, this is the, <laughs> okay, this is uh, the optimal filter, optimal solution approach for linear problems. But uh, in reality, many interesting problems are nonlinear. So we need uh, nonlinear solution approaches so that we can move closer uh, to modeling things more accurately. The first and most straightforward approach is the extended Kalman filter. And then there is also the limiting extended Kalman filter, which was uh, what makes uh, the extended Kalman filter and this uh, framework uh, in general practical. In a, in a real time case, and also the unscented Kalman filter, which is a network, a system that, a model, a solution approach that uh, is receiving a lot of attention recently, lately for many reasons. We'll talk about some of the other alternatives later. So, the Kalman filter in general is a prediction correction approach. So, what we do is we use the transition equation to make a prediction into the future for some intervals without taking into consideration at all what the situation is, what the traffic condition is. It's a simple, if you think about it, it's an autoregressive process. Okay, think about this, a prediction. And then we use the measurements to compute a direction, if you will, towards which we want to, to, to correct this prediction so that it matches our prevailing conditions right now. The extended Kalman filter is a very simple extension of uh, the linear Kalman filter. And what it does is there is a nonlinearity. We linearize it through a first order Taylor expansion. Okay, so essentially we need a gradient. Uh, now, because we use a simulation based model and uh, there is no analytical uh, uh, representation, let alone uh, a differentiable one. Uh, we use uh, numerical derivatives, which means that we need to run our simulator 2n plus 1 times, 2n times. And uh, coming back to why I was uh, going over the number of parameters, if we have in a realistic model 4,000 parameters or 2,000 parameters, we need to run our model 4,000 times. And uh, even if it takes one minute or half a minute, you understand we're talking about many hours, it's clearly not practical. And the most single most expensive computation is this uh, derivation. The rest is uh, uh, not a problem. So we are we are looking for a way to bypass this. And the way that we dealt with it in the limit and extended Kalman filter uh, is uh, using a, a, a pre-computed Kalman gain. So instead of of computing it in real time every time for every interval, we use something else that we take uh, for granted. Now this could be uh, stable and fixed forever. Or this could be something that is being continuously updated or a moving average and so on. It doesn't uh, really matter which approach anybody uses and we haven't really gone into a real detailed investigation of which would work better. But uh, much to our delight, it looked like if we took the average from one day of, 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 a Kalman gain, of Kalman gains from one day and using that for another day, it worked fairly well and actually better than uh, many people expect. And this is a criticism that uh, the results have been getting that they are too good to be true. And the explanation there is partly, or my explanation there is partly because by doing this, we reduce the, the, the noise. So the, this average Kalman gain is more robust. Um, the advantage there is that we only need to simulate or to run the simulator once online because we have all the other information for this uh, fixed Kalman gain, something that we get externally from, 
from, uh, from other ANS previews. Uh, the unscented Kalman filter, I don't want to spend time now, uh, um, but essentially is another way to work with it, a little bit more flexible. It doesn't even assume normality. We compute, uh, uh, it's based on the unscented transformation. One computes a small number of deterministically chosen uh, data points propagates them through the true non-linearity, non so essentially runs the model with these inputs. And then there is a way, because from, uh, coming from the way that these points are chosen, to compute the two first moments of this distribution that we're modeling, so mean and variance, uh, from the output of the new model, from, from, from the way these uh, points are uh, uh, the output of these uh, evaluations. And uh, the problem here is, again, that uh, it, uh, computationally it's as expensive as the extended Kalman filter, and uh, we do not, uh, there is no limiting version possible. So even if it uh, was uh, much, much faster, it's not practical. Very quickly, some uh, results from a case study to verify the importance of this approach. I mean, it's a lot of pain, as it seems, and if it didn't give us some considerable benefits over just using the offline calibration, then it's not worth it. The model uh, we've uh, talked a little bit about, the network is, an, is a freeway network, well, one freeway essentially at now in, uh, in uh, Southampton in the UK. Here you see a, schemast a schematic. It was modeled uh, as 45 segments of uh, three types uh, ramps, main line, and merge, uh, with data from 10 sensors seen with the little red dots, 20 OD pairs, and the data that we used was the PM peak because this is the, the direction, the peak, the peak direction into in this part of the network. Um, you see at the top the the, the flows for all uh, days. They are fairly. Uh, consistent and in the bottom a distinction between dry quote unquote dry days where the weather was good uh, in the UK we found some so and wet days uh, where you see a clearly distinct pattern w that during the peak periods uh, speeds are decreased considerably so uh, as you understand one thing that we differentiate is dry and wet weather to see if the model uh, responds to this, and that's actually the point. That's what we want to do, because if we calibrate for uh, normal days and then test it on normal days, it shouldn't be a surprise that it does well. But then, if we use the offline calibration from the dry days and apply it to wet days, we would want it to somehow switch and respond to that. And the base case, as I said before, it's not that before there was no online calibration, now everything is magically calibrated. What we're doing before, where only the demand was calibrated online is used as the base case. So the base case now is not nothing. It's already that the OD flows are calibrated. And we add the supply parameters and uh, the various uh, solution approaches. Now, what are the measures of effectiveness? Speed and count fitness. So the simulated versus the, the, the actual uh, observed ones using the normalized root mean squared error and uh, an idea about the computational performance. Uh, so we see that uh, one, two, three step prediction. In every case, the algorithm, the first bar is uh, the base case, where only the OD flows are calibrated online, and then the, the three algorithms. We see that they are very close. The one with the blue, this one, is the one with a very favorable computational performance. And essentially, what we want to do is uh, how this performs with respect to the others, and it's almost as good. I mean, it gives some improvement, and this is how it performs in the wet conditions. Uh, it's some percent, 10 or 15 percent improvement. This is a, a, a more eloquent way to show uh, really how it, what it, what's being done. So what you see here is some, the points are this is a density on the x-axis and the speed on the y-axis. So we see some speed density points. And uh, we see the, 
how in the dry weather and in the wet weather the estimated speed density relationships are differentiated. So this dust line is the average, if you will, that was the output of the offline calibration. And then in this case of dry weather, as expected, we see that the points are to the top. So people for the same density are driving faster than the average. And we see that the, the speed density relationships are a little bit in, in this direction, as opposed to the case of the, of the wet weather, where again you see the dust line here, you see all the points to the bottom because under wet, wet conditions people are driving slower presumably and that's what we see. And the, the, the straight lines, solid lines, are the, speed, the estimated speed density relationships for these points that are a little bit towards the points. Now, one could answer, ask, say that these are not a good fit and they would like to see the lines here in the middle of the points, but this is not what we're trying to do because these points are the current conditions and have some information, but this, sol this dust line, the offline calibration, already has in it a lot of information from thousands of points like this, and we don't want to throw that away. We just want to use this information to move a little bit closer. Now, how much closer and why not here? That's a very good question, and that's something that one can uh, somehow control through the weight that one puts to the various inputs. So one can put more, if we put more weight to the, to the new measurements, then we'll move closer to the new measurements. If we put more weight to the prior values, then maybe it wouldn't move at all from, from the offline calibrated. So this is something that can be further investigated. Um, and uh, after we did this first, uh, application where the weights and the variances were computed based on some uh, statistical approaches that are described uh, uh, in the references and so on, we saw that uh, there was a way to improve by, by changing some of the, of the weights manually. So, and we did this test and we saw that even for five-step prediction, by ch and there is, it's, it was not arbitrary, there is some logic to why we increase the value. So for example, because we had more speed measurements, implicitly there was more weight to the speeds. So if one increased the weight to the counts, then they fixed this thing. So it was not totally arbitrary. And what it ended up, what we ended up with by doing this extra test is that even for five step prediction, we saw a clear improvement of, well, or almost the same, uh, of the trend. And on the top, we see speeds. And one could argue as another idea, for example, that, oh no, I would want to tweak my weights so that I get a better fit on the speeds. And I don't care so much for the counts. And why would that be? Because the traffic information that people give through variable message science, for example, in traffic management centers, usually is travel time. So if I get a better fit of the speeds, then presumably I can give better um, uh, better information in terms of travel time. But that's, uh, again, not very, one cannot say it very lightly. In terms of computational performance, uh, just to give an idea, uh, the limit in extended Kalman filter ran for this problem for in 40 th 43 seconds, whereas the other algorithms almost for 100 minutes. So it's clear the, the number of uh, the scale there in the performance. And perhaps most importantly, the limit in extended Kalman filter has a, so, uh, has a, a li I mean, it's the same. It doesn't, it's computation, computational requirements do not increase. It just needs a single function evaluation. Of course, if we're modeling a larger model, it will take longer for this single evaluation. But for the other approaches, besides that, also the number of the function evaluations of the runs of our simulator increases. Uh, now, uh, the conclusions, I think, uh, have been implied throughout. Uh, also, the directions for further research. I would just very quickly, in, a couple of mi in the last couple of minutes, uh, go over some ideas that we're working on right now. And uh, looking at some of the models within, because right now, so far, we haven't tried to improve the models at all. We're just improving the parameters with which each run, each run is made. 
And uh, while we're playing with the more data and different approaches, we thought that maybe we can use a more quote-unquote data-driven approach even in the models. So in the speed density relationship, what we are doing is we are getting densities and getting a speed and moving the vehicles using this speed. But uh, we thought of, of maybe using many data, other sorts of data, maybe weather conditions, or uh, speeds and densities from previous intervals or whatnot, or a uh, an accident that is taking place, somehow put it in a database and somehow get a speed out of this. Obviously now we are moving from rigid uh, formulas to something a little bit softer, maybe a statistical approach. And this is what we have uh, tested. Now, uh, very, just to give an idea of what, uh, how this might look, if you see the speed density relationship and if you see the, the red points that are uh, observations, the classical modified Greenshield speed density relationship is the, the solid line, but then a locally weighted regression is the dust line, which I hope you can see, which is a little bit more flexible. It follows the data. Maybe it doesn't come, obviously, from a fundamental diagram. It doesn't have deep traffic flow theory hidden into it. But uh, at least in this case that we can inspect, it doesn't look unreasonable. And actually, for example, the little, this little part here where it levels off, tapes off, is actually uh, meaningful. And it's actually what we're doing in practice many times in models like that. So we assume that uh, above some density, there is still a very small speed with which vehicles manage to still creep, uh, move. Um, OK, we, and uh, some statistics here. We've seen some improvement, computational. Uh, then we thought about combining these approaches with some clustering classification. So, OK, looking at all the data, you can compute some patterns, get some patterns. But uh, because the traffic data are, have very different characteristics by time of day or by, uh, by area and so on, if we br break them up into different uh, groups, then we can maybe get the the analyze the data from each subgroup and get the different pattern. And uh, so the steps that we need to take in that uh, case is in, in, during a training session, we need to cluster our data, our training data into clusters and fit the, these uh, data-driven approaches into them. And then during the application case, as new, uh, phase, as new data are coming, we first classify the incoming data to each of these clusters and then I apply the fitted models to them. And we have actually seen very uh, good uh, results from this approach. I, I obviously don't have time to go through this, and I don't know uh, if it's at all meaningful here to go very quickly through a visual aid, the so-called box plot, where we see that with the classic method model, there is a bigger spread, and there is also some bias. If we simply use um, locally weighted regression, which is a little bit more flexible, then we improve the spread and the bias. And uh, the advantage here is that we can also add other information. So now it's not only a speed density relationship, but there is a speed density flow relationship. And this adds additional information and improves a further the model. And when we add clustering, it also moves a lot better. So a, cl a combination of clustering and then fitting locally weighted regressions with it, its cluster. And also adding density and flow, so more data into the model, creates a big improvement, both in terms of uh, the spread and the bias. And by the way, the flow is lagged, because a common comment is about the uh, endogeneity there. Uh, I think that uh, sh I should conclude my presentation, and then if something, uh, if there are any questions or anything that uh, you want me to elaborate on, I would be happy to. Thank you. And I will remind people, because we do webcast, uh, to use the microphones on the desk when you do ask questions, holding the touch button down and keeping the red light lit. Thank you. No questions. So everything was very clear, or? Uh, 
Did you do other case studies to test your system? So you just use the one case study to see the outcome to modify your system? Uh, the algorithm, the online calibration, no, it hasn't been tested on another system. Uh, Dynamite has been tested in many systems, in many networks, including Irvine in California, which was the official evaluation site. We're doing a big project now in uh, Westchester, Lower Westchester County in New York. Uh, there was an application also in Switzerland, in uh, an evaluation in Hampton Roads in Virginia. Uh, there are more offline in Korea and Malaysia, and we're pursuing other studies as well. But for the online, this has been the only one, and uh, in any new studies, we're hoping to incorporate it in it. Sure. Sure. So the offline calibration is uh, getting the parameters for the model. So any model has some parameters. So you use a, a bunch of archived data, maybe from a week, from a month, and then come up with some values that best result the model to be best fit into these parameters. And this is what has been often been used as, as uh, the state of the art. Now, the, the point that we're trying to make here is that this is very useful. We're not trying to throw this away, though presumably, because this offline calibra calibration is very, uh, a very painful, lengthy, and expensive process, presumably one can argue that if we have enough data, we can start a warm-up phase with a, in, with a network without good calibrated parameters, let it run for a while, and then it will pick up the correct parameters, but I'm diverging now. So the point of this distinction about offline and online calibration is the following. Offline calibration does a global optimization, so it doesn't have any information really about what the value of these parameters should be. It might have, we might have some prior information, but we start off with very little weight usually to it, and we want the data to get us to the right values. And uh, in the online calibration now, what we do is the following. We say that using this data from a month, which included rainy days, wet days, and so on, you have come up with some value of the parameters. And this value is the average. So overall, it's probably the value that if you use it for the entire month, will give you the best results overall. But what if we could, for each time interval, use the data from the last 15 minutes to get an idea of what the current conditions are. So if we are, we are in the middle, where we have the mean, va va the, the mean of this param variable, should we move in this direction or in that direction, and how far? And uh, that's what we're trying to, to see, and what we did. So we moved each of the parameters a little bit, and we saw that it makes, in, indeed, as expected, uh, it improves the performance a little bit. So, but it's a local optimization step that as, does not throw away all the other information. It builds on that information with some weight and then moves around it a little bit every time, hoping that it moves in the right direction and it's closer to the true, quote unquote, true or realized value of the parameter. I don't know if that helps at all. Okay, thank you. Please. So if, if the question about geographic areas is about transferability, so whether if you we, the, the Kalman gain that we have computed here for, for Southampton can be used to, I don't know, Portland or something like that, no way. It's, it's the model anyway, because the Kalman gain uh, captures the model. So it's dimensions and so on, capture the number of parameters. So I don't think that one could easily take some of the output 
and ad apply it somewhere else. It's, uh, it's just that, uh, it's a, think about it as a gradient. So rather than computing the gradient every time for any optimization, then one could, uh, um, could use something that one has used before. Again, it's, this is a, a, a rather controversial <laughs> issue within many presentations that I've made. First of all, people think that it's a rather uh, gross approximation. Empirically, in this application, it seemed to work well. And uh, this robustness thing uh, is a plausible explanation because this is, these are very noisy, rather noisy simulators, as I haven't mentioned, but I should have. And clearly, the question of which approximation is better, whether it's a moving average, whether it's, whether it's yesterday's Kalman gain or uh, something like that, is a very important question. And, and how often do you say that it is uh, altered, or is it? What we have done in this case is we ran the extended Kalman filter for one day, and we took the, the average of the Kalman gains for, from this day and applied it to two different days, one with dry weather and one with uh, wet weather. So in this case, it was just a simple average from one day. Now, I, I, so I cannot really say what uh, one could do, but one could play with many things. Instead of this average, for example, one could do a weighted average where for the same, where the, the Kalman gain from the same interval from the previous days could be given, a b from the previous day could be given a bigger weight. Yeah. Another thing uh, that uh, I would like to mention at this point is that we are looking also at other algorithms, uh, solution algorithms for this. And actually last Monday in a conference in Seattle, I presented uh, an, an algorithm uh, that uh, works uh, a lot differently and overcomes this issue and this big discussion of which Kalman gain and why yesterday's and not two days ago. And what we did there was use the stochastic uh, simultaneous perturbation stochastic approximation algorithm to compute this gradient. So instead of uh, getting the numerical derivative through 2n uh, runs of the simulator, we use an algorithm that has been proposed some 15 years ago uh, by SPAL to, to get it with simple two, simply two runs of the simulator. And it uses a clever... Um, it, instead of, as you, most people should know, is the numerical derivatives, you take each parameter and you perturb it a little bit to the one side and then a little bit to the other side and see how this perturbation uh, reflects to the output. What this algorithm does, it, simul uh, it perturbs everything simultaneously through some pattern and, th and then tries to extract the, the contribution of the, each of the perturbation to the output. So it's uh, actually, it seems too good to be true. But apparently works. I had uh, started working with that at some point and gave it up because it seems too good to be true. And a good friend of mine uh, worked on that a little bit more and uh, convinced me that it works. So that's another interesting direction. <laughs> You're welcome. Since I work on the data side, I'm just curious about kind of the data needs. I, s I noticed you had 10 sensors or so on the Southampton site, but what what resolution, if, if we were to try to implement something here, what what resolution do you really need? Well, I, spatially uh, and temporally. Yeah. So I guess that can, that's not specific to the online stuff, but generally to the DTA. Uh, we have done real, first of all, the more the better, okay? So we obviously we're talking about the minimum requirements. And one of the things that I have encountered several times is that when we try to talk to a to, uh, to a traffic management center or an MPO or whatever, they go out and say, oh, I have why ca don't, haven't you done this and that? Oh, we don't have enough data. That's what we answer. And they say, if you come to me, I have all the data that you want, perfect data, everything you want. Then we start, we sit down and start talking and we see that it's not the case and something is not working. But we have done applications in realistic networks uh, with, uh, and by realistic I mean 2,000 links and five, 600 OD pairs, where if you, one has 50, 60 sensors, uh, that's, that can work. Of course, there are other, uh, obviously, I mean, as you understand, it, these have to be uh, well uh, distributed on the, on the network so that you have a coverage so that you can have observability. So one problem that we have in an application now in New York is that they have, uh, I don't know, six, seven or more pa pretty much parallel arteries into uh, New York City and then out in the afternoon. 
and only some of, so the, the sensors are concentrated in some of these. So the problem is that you don't really have a feel of the residual capacity of the situation in the other uh, arteries. And what we have done is simulated some scenarios where we didn't re we have matched the counts in the ones in the roads that we we have information about, but for the others. Uh, we don't have a lot of information, so this is more useful. If you have many sensors on the same artery, that doesn't help, that could actually cause a problem. Uh, I mean, for numerical uh, reasons, and if there are discrepancies and so on. Temporally? Oh, uh, uh, generally, uh, the, the, the horizon, the interval that we want to work with is 15 minutes. Uh, people want to do five minutes and uh, even less. There are several reasons why we still feel 15 minutes are better, even though we have tried five in the Los Angeles case. Uh, one thing is obviously because if you have five minutes, then it means that you have to run in three or four, or less than five in any case, uh, whereas with 15 you have a little bit more room to move around. Uh, another thing is that if you want to do a one-hour prediction with a 15-minute intervals, you do four-step prediction into the future. If you do have five minutes to do a, a one-hour prediction, you need 12 intervals, 12 steps into the future. And as prediction moves like that into the future, uh, presumably you lose some information. Of course, you keep updating this as you move every interval, but still it's, uh, you know, have five minutes worth of data and predict one hour into the future has some challenges. One yeah. more general question about, uh, I didn't mean to interrupt. In terms of diversion, are th is there good information about how drivers react to suggestions for diversion? What percentage of people will do the opposite, or what percentage will do what, what is suggested? That's a, a, a very big uh, question, and that's really the problem. I mean, it w people, when talking especially with people from network telecommunication, uh, tel telecommunication networks, they have similar problems as ours, uh, but their packages tend to be more obedient and more compliant to the suggestions, uh, whereas ours uh, do not. Uh, but uh, for one thing, these systems uh, ex uh, assume that the parameters of the models are externally provided, or the, of the behavioral models, and these are very um, data, very in a different way, data intensive. Uh, uh, applications to, to, to calibrate these models, to estimate these models. And uh, what we do, because we never have data on the, the data that are needed to estimate these behavioral models, which are uh, surveys, data to reveal preference uh, experiments, we do w what we call aggregate calibration. So from the counts uh, or uh, travel times or whatever we have, we try to to get the values of all the other parameters that are input into the model. And it's an indirect way to do it, but that's the only practical thing. Also because these values of the parameters of the behavior vary from network to network and even from day to day. Because if you have commuters uh, you know, in the peaks, these behave very different than tourists or people going shopping uh, and so on. Um. <coughs> I'm kind of interested in the potential for DTA in planning applications. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, and some of the work I've done in the past, um, we sort of ex looked at it but at a very distant, I was involved in some work with Transims, and we actually experimented with applying DynaSmart to the Portland network, and we found that it couldn't handle the problem size, it couldn't handle the number of zones in the network, and we had to reduce it much further than we wanted to. Um, could you comment at all about where dynamic traffic assignment is in terms of being able to handle regional planning applications and what is required? Do you have to include, for example, signal timing and that sort of thing? What type of, or what size network would you, were you thinking about? Can you give us an idea of the zones and links, or? I don't know. Yeah, how many links do you have? You have 2,000. Yeah, roughly 25,000 links or so. Yeah. And maybe 2,000 zones. Yeah, 2,000. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's uh, it would be an interesting challenge. I don't think, I mean, to, to go into that uh, 
there, these models don't have explicit uh, size, um, you know, limits. I don't know. I don't think Dynasmart does, but Dynamite definitely doesn't. But it's uh, a matter of memory and so on. The problem is that many of these algorithms blow up proportionally. So, for example, if you do the OD estimation, and you need to. So, if you're talking about you said 2,000 zones, so a dense, a, a full matrix would be. Four million, uh, yeah, four million. Oh, I mean, you know, you, and if you want to do all the estimation to that, you need uh, an assignment matrix with that, with two million by twenty thousand. If that's your links, it gets out of hand. So it's these sort of problems mostly that uh, I see. But uh, so yeah, it's uh, the, the decomposition will become practical maybe and helpful in that uh, case. One, in general, uh, approaches, uh, hybrid approaches are being used. So uh, not in this level, but going a level uh, lower, when, uh, when people are between microscopic or mesoscopic simulation, they say, OK, I'm going to use to model the region with a meso and then use microscopic islands in the areas where I need it more. So this is very active, but in a different uh, level. I'm not sure if something similar could be useful in uh, in these planning cases where perhaps you could use, I don't know what you're using now, m 2 or whatever, for the whole region. And then, so if I, what we were talking about, was it Portland? or uh, No, probably more than that, like the region or something. And then use uh, DTA for, for the city or some more dense area. I don't know. That, of course, has a, other challenges. You have to deal with boundary conditions, a big deal of complication. Uh, but this is just a... It's mostly computation. I don't see problems like that. So the way things are moving, I think in a few years, perhaps already, this could be feasible. Uh, and another thing is whether, I mean, of course, that's what you want to avoid. But uh, do you really need uh, all these uh, 20,000 links in a planning network? That's, that's another. But that's what I would say to, to get you to reduce your network size. You know. Before we thank our speaker, I'll just mention that next week uh, Sharon Wood Wortman will be here. Her presentation is called Bridge Stories, which is also, uh, she's also the author of, oh, I'm sorry, that's two weeks. So two weeks from today, Sharon Wood Wortman, Portland Bridge Book author, will be here and she'll be signing copies of her book. Next week, though, Zach Horowitz, who's uh, with the Columbia River Crossing Project, he's going to be talking about freight railroad capacity alternatives in the Pacific Northwest an analysis of class one cooperation in the Columbia River Corridor. So with that, let us thank our speaker, Costa Antonio. Thank you very much. And by the way, Costas just published his book on something related to this topic. So if you're interested, uh, you can find it on uh, Amazon.com. <laughs>